Hi, and welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know. My name is AJ Hannenberg, and I am joined by Graham Donaldson. Hey. And Thomas Magby. Hello. And this is a podcast about the classical world. We're just trying to bring old things to you in a way that you can deal with them. So it's not, uh, you know, we're not, we're not too intense around here. It's, we're just uh, <laughs> taking it easy. On the old classical train. Man, our intros are always so but good. This, but this old stuff, you know, it's it made us. This is this is where we're from, as Westerners. Yeah. So let's learn it. Yeah. So know mm. like know your background and stuff. So <laughs> let's get we're getting real intense about it now. Sorry. Yeah. I'm just really aggressive about it all of a sudden. Why haven't you learned this stuff? Yeah. So yeah, I'll we're tell just you a podcast yeah. about the classical world. Uh, we hope you enjoy it. And today we got some stuff from Mr. Thomas Magby. Howdy. Uh, I'm going to be talking about translation today, but before we get into that, um, we're, it's the summer right now, and yep. everyone's been traveling. Many people have been traveling. Some people have traveled recently. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about what you've been up to these last couple of weeks of uh, vacation summertime? Um, Starting with Graham? Yeah. So my wife, Amanda, works for a company, and they sent her to London and then for a big conference. And then I joined her later, and we went and we hung out in beautiful Cotswolds, England, which is very beautiful, but it's also where all the old people live. And so it was us and old <laughs> Cotswolds Brits. Cotswolds sounds like that kind of place. Yeah, it, it was like us an and all of these really old Brits, but we didn't care because it was very gorgeous. And then we went to Portugal for something like 16 days and drove around and drank wine. Well, I drank wine, and Mana doesn't drink. She, she was doing the driving. Uh, I also drove. <laughs> oh, oh, no. Um, uh, and uh, <laughs> Portugal It's just like incriminating fun. yourself. Anyway. Oh, I have a great Portugal story. So we were uh, staying in this small town that we didn't want to stay in. Long story. But it was the day when Portugal was p playing Spain in the World Cup. Mm. And Portugal was down two goals uh, to three. And towards the end of the game, Ronaldo scored the tying goal from a free kick. And we were watching it in this tiny little hotel in this small little mountain town, and the entire town just erupted. <laughs> it was like every house was, was full watching. of joy. <laughs> it was the creepiest thing because you would look, put you, you'd go, put your head out the window, and you wouldn't see anybody, but you could just hear muffled screams of joy from every from every house. It was pretty. It was kind of spectacular. So watching the Portuguese, not win. <laughs> <laughs> but tie a game uh, in a small town Portugal. That was what I did this summer. Yeah, it's a good time. It was fun. Yeah. AJ, you went on the on the Europe trip with yeah. our students. Yeah, so we went to seventeen days, several tour cities: uh, London, Paris, Lucerne. We went to Pisa briefly. I've never been to Pisa oh. before. Yeah, it was cool. Mm. And then Florence, Rome. They didn't go there on previous trips. We always went to Milan. Oh, okay. Or one year Dijon. And then we went to one place called Bern. Bjorn, Bjorn, Born, Bern, 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 Bern. How was it? It was great. Okay. We went to a little market. I had a pizza. <laughs> Sounds great. I missed, so it was in France, and there was <laughs> this beautiful street market, but I, I dilly-dallied, and I waited too long to order food, so everybody was closing up, and I missed... There, there, everybody was French except for one British lady who was really <laughs> sort of body and making burritos. And I really wanted a British lady's burrito, but she was close enough. Mm, it's too bad. So, sounds like you need to go back. Body British burritos. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was awesome. So yeah, I, I traveled and did Rome and did Capri and did the whole party, and then I've been lazy ever since. <laughs> how, are the, how are the monks there, Magby? Uh, monks are great. I went to a monastery in Kentucky for a week. Uh, it's the um, Gethsemane Abbey. It's the same monastery that Thomas Merton um, was a monk at. And he yeah, did that for a week. It was great. Um, they pray seven times a day. And it just and it's silent. It's a silent Trappist monastery. So uh, the only speaking they do is the seven times a it's day. It's a trap. It's a Trappist <laughs> monastery. That's how they open the speaking <laughs> portion. That's a trap. <laughs> I don't think they watch a lot of movies there. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe that's... They have to watch Star Wars before they can come in. Admiral Ackbar was a Trappist monk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, that was really great. Um, did a lot of reading there. It was, it was really good. And then before that, I went to Colorado with our freshmen. Um, yeah, it, how was that? It was a really good time. Every So um, there's a class trip for, 
I guess each of our grades. Recently, our senior year trip moved to the junior year trip, and that's the Europe trip that AJ was just talking about. The ninth grade trip is a trip to Colorado. Uh, we go up there, and we uh, raft, and we hike, and we uh, climb rocks, and it's really, really fun. You bond. You we cry do. at the campfire. We We're totally going to be best friends when this when camp is over, all that stuff. Your sweatshirt smells like campfire, which is my favorite thing. When that happens, I don't wash my sweatshirt or yeah. my hair for like a week. <laughs> just to keep that smell. Just to keep the smell. If they made a cologne that was campfire... Whoa. Oh, that's gross. Um, so, yeah, it was, that was a really good time also. Cool. Um, and then spent some time out in the Hill Country to celebrate my wife's birthday this recent weekend. So. Happy birthday, Sarah. Happy birthday, Sarah. Uh, so, yeah, it's been a really good um, summer. So we're recording now end of June. So still a couple months left of summer. School us, maybe. Should I? Yes. It's what's happening next. So I feel like I should be doing an episode on leisure. but maybe Perhaps we should translate to the next the po- well, actually, part of the podcast. You know, guys, I really don't know what you're, t- what you're talking about today. Well, you, you, you all kind of never do because I'm, I give obtuse answers. Um, so, uh, guys, I think that translation is a total waste of time. And so I, I'm actually kind of curious. You mean like translating from one language to the other? Well, yeah, because, you know, I think that we should only read things in their original languages. And so Ugh. I'm wondering, um, AJ, how you're going to train people to read Old English so they can access this Beowulf thing or... Graham, I mean, you want to read Dante's uh, Purgatory next year. I mean, it's a lot of Italian you need to train these uh, students in before they can actually access this book. Medieval Italian. Wait, are you being facetious? You really think it's a waste of time? I don't know. Do I? So, um, yeah. What are you all going to do? Like, do you all teach them any of the original language when you go into these books of Beowulf or, I mean, all the Greek that you read, Iliad and Odyssey? I don't know any of the other original languages. I mean, I can't. You teach... You're going to teach a book written in Italian. It's true. And that I can't read. Mm-hmm. What? And know. Homeric Greek isn't even like normal Greek. But like... It's, it's, it's like... It's harder than Bible Greek. It's, it's like Shakespeare is to English, right? It's bizarre. It's different. But like... We should come back to the Shakespeare thing in a little bit. But like, can you get... I don't know. You want these kids to get these certain things from these books. I don't I'm know. Sad. And now I'm sad. But like, don't you want like the pure? Isn't it pure for them to go to the work itself in its original language and access it that way than to read through? Like, isn't isn't the translator taking something away by moving it into English instead of it being in the original language? Yes, but my question is: given a good translator who faithfully reproduces the the tone of the work, is it worth the effort of learning Homeric Greek so I can read the Iliad and the Odyssey? We're talking years of study for two books. And if we're going to do that for every book we read, it's impractical to make that jump. So there's nothing worthwhile in the Iliad and the Odyssey that would be... That's not what I said. I said if there are things worthwhile in the Iliad and the Odyssey and we spend the time learning Homeric Greek, we are edging out all of the other things we could do. We don't don't have time to do that and learn the Italian for Dante and learn the Old English for Beowulf and learn the Aramaic for the Bible and learn that Greek for that Bible and learn the Greek for today's Greek books and learn Spanish and learn Canadian, right? We don't have time <laughs> for all that stuff. Language. Yep. So yeah, I, we're oot and a boot doing other things. <laughs> what is he saying? <laughs> it's all the same words. vowels. They only <laughs> have one. <laughs> Speak English. Um, so I, I hear you that like there's a difficulty to it, but I don't know, like if you're telling me that these books are important, shouldn't it also, you're telling me the books are important and then also that I'm losing something by getting an English translation instead of the original Greek or um, Old English or Italian, medieval Italian. Um, I don't know. Like, isn't there some amount of the original language that I should know to be I able to access like these works? I kind of feel like the burden's on you to tell us why translations lose things when books have been translated and the Bible's translated into English. Has the Bible lost anything by being translated? Oh, that, that I, I don't know. I can't. I don't know because I don't know the original language. So, I so, mean, so I think it's a cost-benefit analysis. You say they should learn some of the language so they can access the book. The language that they could learn in a couple of months—that's not enough to access the high things I want them to learn. Mm. And the the amount of effort we'd have to go through to get the the few valuable things is impractical. It's just like should when I teach my students modern particle physics or whatever have them go through all of the mathematical work that Galileo did to Mm. figure out his models of the universe. And before that, the Ptolemaic universe, right? When he put the Earth at the center and actually put the cosmos revolving around a little bit off-center outside the Earth. Should I have them do all the math and repeat what he did? Yeah, but 
is it worth the effort <sighs> so, to get so them you're, to So understand? you're saying like the better way to do it is original language. The better way to do it is what you just said. Like if we had more time, we would go through all that stuff. If I was a vampire and lived eternally, <laughs> I would do all. Do? Yeah, I would do all these things in their original. I, before I read Dante, I would learn the Italian. I would learn how to play piano and then play Mozart rather than just listening to it. Right, all of these things I would do the long way around. But we only have so many years, guys. I'm going to argue the opposite of that. I'm going to argue that things are not lost or at least not lost to the degree that we might think they are in a translated work, and that, in fact, it might be better for us to be reading a translated work than even the process of learning the language and going back to the original. You hoodwinked us. I, I knew it. 100% did. Yeah. I'm furious. Uh, really? So the uh, main essay that I'm going off of for today's discussion is Walter Benjamin. Um, have you heard of this guy before? No. Literary critic um, for in the... Does he play accordion? Or? Does that sound like an accordion name? <laughs> Like Walter Benjamin? One of those old folk albums you find at the <laughs> back of the record store. Oh, yeah. Oh, Walt. <laughs> With, like, the soft focus uh, cover art. Um, and so his... <laughs> yep. Uh, his essay is titled... Polka the t- Pete and the Paninis by <laughs> Walter Benjamin. <laughs> oh, it does sound like that. Um, uh, his, the essay is titled The Task of the Translator. Uh, Walter Benjamin was born uh, 1892 in Berlin, uh, died 1940. Um, uh also in Berlin? No, oh. in Spain. He oh. was trying to, um, so this is time of World War II, he was trying to flee Germany, and so his story is essentially him moving town to town, trying to get out, and eventually um, uh, he was told that the Gestapo were going to come after him, and he ended up committing suicide to avoid being captured oh. by the Gestapo. Um, but yeah, so, um, but um, he worked in universities uh, leading up to that. He was a student of philosophy, student of literary criticism, um, and then also um, a, a translator and had many thoughts on translation, which leads us to our book today. Um, okay, so uh, AJ, in your last episode, you had some really interesting ex- examples from Beowulf um, about words that are translated in there that mean different things. So um, I'm going to give you two examples that I wrote down, and I'm sure you gave more. But you talked about a guy who wrecks mead benches, and you talked about someone who is a ring giver. Do you remember giving those examples? I do recall. <laughs> it just feels like a, what's it called in court? It's like I'm cross-examining right now or something. So um, when the expression, uh, when you say someone wrecks mead benches, if you said that phrase today, what would that phrase mean? It means I got drunk and wrecked my chair. <laughs> I like that. I fell down at a garden party. and. <laughs> but in Beowulf, what did it mean there? It means denying a place to drink for other men because you have killed them. Yeah. So it was a euphemism for killing. Killing people. Yeah. Uh, so imagine that you were... Well, I'm actually curious about this. You referenced two translations that you used last time. Do both of them translate that phrase? Do both of them have that um, Hrothgar is one who wrecks mead benches? And there's no reason you should know this. I apologize. No, no. Yeah. I, I, I've, I've noted that particular phrase. I think in this one, uh, in the Tolkien translation, because his lines are longer and he tries less faithfully to stick to the meter of the verse, uh, he actually says he denied drinking benches to other men. It is. Rather than in the Seamus Haney version where it says he was a wrecker of meat benches. But this is perfect. Okay, so if we were to go back to the original Old English and look at that phrase, which I have no intention of doing. This is all theoretical. What do you think it actually says? <laughs> oh, thank you. That, that, that's even better. So first off, it would be incomprehensible because we don't speak Old English. But the point I'm, I'm making is if we went word by word and translated the Old English, do you think it specifically mentions mead right there? Yeah. I, I would bet that it does, mm-hmm. right? Don't you think? And does it specifically mention benches right there? Yep. And does it do you use some type of word that references destruction, wrecking, destroying, something in that vein? Yeah. But is it helpful for us if we go word by word and only translate that and not give context to what that phrase means? Let me ask it a different way. Um, the author of Beowulf is unknown, correct? Yes. So um, when the author was writing the sentence in Old English to describe Hrothgar, was the purpose and intention of, that that author was doing to say Hrothgar destroys benches? No. What was his intention? That what? Hrothgar is somebody who has killed men. Yes. So imagine that there's a translation that says that. Mm-hmm. That says Hrothgar was a dude that killed people. Mm-hmm. They don't mention the meat benches, but they mention that part of it. Mm-hmm. Is that a good translation? It's it's translating it, but stripping it of the poetry in a way. Like it, it's giving you the the meaning, but it's 
taking away the color. It's giving you the peanut without the candy coating and the chocolate of the M and M. Yes. Okay. So you're so it would be a more utilitarian. And given peanuts are are are, can, are M and M peanuts. Well, yeah. You take the M and M peanuts. Well, that's a superior way to consume ten M&M times out of ten. Peanut. Yeah. It is peanut M and M is the better M and M. So the better, the better peanut. Yeah. Well, so this is. So I mean, what, what are we talking about here? Are we talking about M and M's? Because <laughs> if we're talking about non peanut M and M's, that's just the worst Reese's pieces. What's going on? That's what that is. <laughs> you think Reese's you, pieces are better than M and M's? Do you oh, not? I would take a peanut M and M over a Reese's. Oh no, I'm saying like peanut oh, M and M's right? are the top tier. Tip top. Yeah. If you're if you're stepping down, if you're comparing like. M and M's with just the chocolate inside. Uh-huh. We're Two talking. Reese's pieces? Yeah, Reese's pieces would win every time. This is, this is what I'm saying. Yeah. This is what I'm what saying. Is going on? The, a normal M M&M and M with no peanut is a worse Reese's piece. But you should have all three in a bowl at once, and then just take a <laughs> handful of it. Wait, why would I want the lesser the M M&M and M that? Yeah, because you need no, the contrast. What, the contrast helps. See, you're you're going too far. I think what you do is you take a Reese's peanut butter cup, and then you put Reese's pieces on top of that. And then peanut M on top of that. Put those in a graham cracker, <laughs> and you stick that sucker in the microwave, mm. and you got yourself a treat. Mm. You got a stew going. So speaking of treats, how about Beowulf, which is a treat of literature? So um, what do you think, Maybe? Do you think that it is a good translation if you just said Rothgar killed men and versus... was a good king? So we're we're conflating two things because this is this is important. So um, there's the poetry of the language in the Old English. This is um, often mm-hmm. talked about. Um, so. Graham, you're going to teach um, Paradise, um, or I'm sorry, um, Purgatory. Purgatory, Dante's Purgatory next year. Um, and I don't know the details of this, but you probably do. There's this very specific rhyming scheme that Dante uses. Terzarima. Could um, could you go into it briefly? Can't remember. Okay, so. I, I know it. It's. Uh, I'm sorry, you teach the Inferno. Why? Sorry. <laughs> it's yeah. Stanzas of three. Yeah. And it goes, the rhyme scheme goes A, B, A, mm-hmm. B, C, B, yeah. C, D, C. So the ensuing. The middle line is always the the top and bottom line of the next stanza. Yes. In terms of rhyme. In terms of rhyme. Okay. And you can have as many as you want, and you end in either a single line or a couplet, generally. Okay. But, um, and you have to faint at some point. Yes. <laughs> in Beowulf. Yeah. <laughs> no, not in Dante, Beowulf. And Dante, Dante passes out all the time. Um, Beowulf never <laughs> no, passes he never, out. That man he has never slept. <laughs> Uh, or breathed apparently with his nine hours underwater um, <laughs> and swimming in the ocean with chainmail. But when you read uh, an English translation of uh, the Inferno, do they follow that rhyming scheme? Not necessarily. No, I think there's a translation that tries Wordsworth, yeah. and Isn't it? it's janks. It's supposed to be bad. Be- I, I, from what little reading I do, you've actually read it, I'm sure. No, no, or no. parts no. of it, whatever. I, but- I have heard that it's... I, I read a little bit once in a, in a library, and it was impossible, and then I <laughs> switched. Well, because... What was Wordsworth's goal there? The goal was not faithful representation of um, the meaning of this text. It was following this very specific structure of the text. Mm-hmm. Correct. Like, th- there's a difference between those two. Correct. And so when you're reading the Inferno, they throw out, not throw out, they wish they could have the same rhyming scheme because it's probably beautiful in whatever old Italian they're they're writing it in. But it just doesn't work in English. doesn't work in English. And so instead of butchering the English, they choose to throw it out and... Make an English translation. It's like when you try to take the Psalms <laughs> mm-hmm. and turn it into a song. It doesn't really work. It probably worked really well in Hebrew. Yeah. But like finding a good tune to actually fit the English translation of the Psalms is always super janky. Yeah. Because it's not because hill and war don't rhyme. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so and again, like the the singing of it was tied to the Hebrew itself. It wasn't it's not tied to the English mm-hmm. in the same way. Or it's not that's not the goal of the translator is to um uh, copy that same element of it. So wh- the only point I'm trying to get at is you lose something. There's a form that you miss in the Inferno going from old Italian to the English that we have today. But let's take our, we, we can do either example, but just because we've been talking about Beowulf, let's take Beowulf. And let's say that you went back to the original old English and you sat there with a the dictionary and you went word by word through it. Would you understand that text more than you do now? And I understand it in this scenario? Yes. So you have the dictionary. So like, you see a word, and you look it up, and then you translate the word. If you go word by word, will you understand Beowulf more? But that's sort of a, a false analogy, because when you are translating something, often it'll say, you know, you, you get to a word, and it'll say, well, you can translate this word as, as, as avenge. You can translate this word as... Ice cream. Honor kill. You can translate this word as uh, blood price. Like, 
the the translation said, you know, it's not like there's a one to one ratio between the old English words and the new English word or our English words. Um, um, in my very little Greek that I've done, in my very little Latin that I've done, you know, two students will translate the very simple Aesop's fable, mm-hmm. but you'll have different. You've you've making you've made different choices on some of the words that have different connotations. You know, the the articles are often going to be the, are always going to be the same, but the verbs or the uh, and the nouns will be the same. But often the verbs and the adverbs. Uh, we'll change the which will change the meaning of it, and you need to sort of figure out which one you think fits the best. And so you're saying that they're different, mm-hmm. but can one be better than the other? I think yes, because it, it's taking it into the context of the rest of there the. So I didn't, a, a translation is an interpretation. Yes, absolutely. Um, when you say that, is that a good thing, a bad thing, just a statement? I think, I think most people mean that as a negative to say. When Seamus Haney uh, translated Beowulf, he made choices about what he thought Beowulf was about, and therefore, yeah. it's not the original. Sometimes the cover of the song is better than the song. Say more. Well, just sometimes um, someone who covers a famous song can do a better version of that song. Yes. So I'll give you an example. Um, so Be My Baby, you know, Be My, Be My Baby. There's that song, the 1950s or whatever it is. Maybe we'll put links to it in the show notes. And then there's a there's a cover of the song by um, AJ. You told me about this guy. It's not DJ Stith. It's D DM Stith. DM Stith does a cover of "Be My Baby" that is very different. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the same song, but it's definitely a different kind of interpretation, mm-hmm. and it's awesome. Um, um, but, but anyway, but what I'm good, saying, my, my point is, is like, is like, it's good for different reasons. It's good right? for different reasons. And so I assume, so Wordsworth's translation, I don't think it's Wordsworth, but whoever did the translate, I think it was Pope who did the translation of, of Dante with the Terzarima rhyme was, do, was making an interpretive choice to keep the rhyme and to, and to maybe kick out some of the easiness of reading. Mm-hmm. Whereas Dorothy Sayers doesn't have the rhyme, but has this very great translation. And then the one that I'm choosing for my 10th grade class that is, Esselin, is yeah. Anthony Esselin, yeah. um, which I actually haven't read yet. I'm doing that this summer. You know, so yeah, so each interpretation, each, each translation is an interpretation. And there's a reason why some of these translations get their own sort of status in the halls of, of Western canon. Um, because they've taken medieval Italian and turned it into English and were faithful mm-hmm. and created something great. Yeah. So let's, we'll follow that. I'm going to start quoting a bit from the essay um, as we go into it. Um, so just to kind of summarize where I think we are right now is that um, anyone translating, if we are not native speakers of old English, um, and we are we have to translate at some point what these words say if we're going to translate Beowulf. So even if I go to the original text and then go word by word with the dictionary, that doesn't mean I get it. That doesn't make it any clearer necessarily because you need to be literate of the old yes. language yourself. Yeah, because so, you need to sort of know the feel the blood and like know the. Uh, you need to live in that world to be able to bring it to us. Yeah, and and that is more than just the ability to translate. That's actually like living mm-hmm. in. 500s or whenever you said Beowulf was written, like actually living in that time, then I would actually, I'd have some semblance of what's being said right there. Um, But even, so that's kind of where we are right now. So it would still be better if we lived in that culture and then we could really get the story. So it's always going to be a lesser version of what we're, what we read now. Right. Like if we had more time, it'd be great to study Italian, medieval Italian, and study Latin. And probably those things are great, but we'll get into that. Okay. So, um, well, this is why C.S. Lewis said that like learning Greek and Latin was a great joy because then you can read these things in their original language and you and you get all of this color and all of this. It's it's like looking at a picture on the internet of a work of art mm-hmm. and then going and seeing it in person in the Louvre, yeah, or whatever. Like then this is the this is an experience our students have all the time to- all the time when they go on their Europe trip. They've seen Picture, or um, pictures of comedy. whatever, and then they go, and then they're like, oh, my goodness, when I get up close and I look at the paint and I can see the brush strokes, um, it's very, it's, it's, yeah, it's like a di- very 
different experience. Yeah. But not everybody can take a trip to the Louvre. Right. So a lot, some of us have to be content with just looking at pictures on the internet. And I guess it's better than not seeing the picture at all. Exactly, yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't know how this plays into it, but we... How many students continue on to like the highest level of a language, foreign language, to be able to read works in their original language? Um, when I was in high school, I took Spanish 5, and one of the hallmarks of Spanish 5 is getting to read Don Quixote in the original Spanish, and I was so excited to get into it, and then started reading it and realized it's a different Spanish than what I've been learning for the last four <laughs> years. Like, it's, 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 like it, whatever. Um, they use a different verb form than uh, is common in Spanish. It's more common in Spain, but they use a verb form that's unfamiliar to people who learn Spanish in Texas, and um, the word choice is different. Um, anyway, so there's all this excitement, and then you get there, and it's actually kind of a different experience. Um, You're making me want to like study Greek so I can read Homer. That's not a bad goal. Or study. Well, yeah, I feel like Italian you guys are saying so completely Dante. different things. You're yeah. like I'm saying it is, you, a, it is more disappointing with all that work to then get to the work itself and realize I've been training the wrong way. <laughs> Or there's more I need to learn before I can really get to Don Quixote in its original language. And Graham, you seem excited that kids can't read things in their original language. What I'm realizing is like what the translator does, it's like they're a time traveler and they're bringing back these relics from the past to make it, I'm not going to say relevant for the modern reader, but they're, but they're, they are, they're like curators of history. I don't know. They're. But they're more. little magicians. Okay, so um, um, what's this guy's name? Benjamin, Walter Benjamin. Sorry, I forgot his name. That's embarrassing. Uh, so th- he gets at some of the ideas we're talking about right now. Uh, is the purpose of translation just to communicate information to me from an old language into a new language? And he says, no, um, any translation that intends to perform a transmitting function cannot transmit anything but communication. And he defines communication just as those individual words. Um, so. They can only transmit some uh, communication, hence something inessential. The translation of each individual word is not helpful. That's not what we go to books for. We don't go to them for these individual words. We go to them for something deeper, and we'll get to that later. Um, and he says this is the hallmark of bad translations. People who are just trying to match, um, who bringing uh, words from a different language into a new language. So that's the hallmark of a bad translation. Um, he goes on. Um, he has this question about whether a work is translatable or not, which I'm not going to go into. Um, he talks about traditional translation being about conveying the form and meaning of the original as accurately as possible. Um, and that's kind of what we're getting at with whoever wrote this translation of Dante with rhyming, that the goal that they have is um, matching a certain form. But matching a form that worked in an old language is not the same as making a form work in the new language. Um, English is different than Italian. Um, it, it is easier to rhyme words in Italian because a majority of them end with O. Oh. Yeah, right? Like, <laughs> I don't know. Isn't it O or A? Like a majority of them, or an, an I, a majority of them are going to end with a vowel, um, as opposed to English, where it's not nearly, um, it's the same in Spanish. When you read Spanish poetry, it's very easy to rhyme words together. Uh, it's not nearly as easy in English. Um, and so if you were to try and match the rhyming of Spanish and English, it wouldn't work very well um, because the languages are different. Um, um, so this gets to what Graham was just saying, and I, I wanted to go here for a little bit. Um, Benjamin says that a, po- a part of what translation is, is that uh, a translation is a transformation and a renewal of something living. Uh, the, undergo- the original undergoes a change. Even words with fixed meaning can undergo a maturing process. So even words... If I know what a word means, words change meaning over time. Mm -hmm. So even translating word to word, even this is what I wanted to talk about with Shakespeare. Like in reading Shakespeare, he uses words differently than we do. And so I, in 2018, cannot just read Shakespeare by itself. Maybe I can't. Well, we have, quote, translations of Shakespeare. My students do it all the time. They do the, like, no fear Shakespeare. And that's like... It's helpful in a way. It's helpful in a way, but it's... Are you okay? Shakespeare, Shakespeare I'm not, is not so foreign to the modern yeah, tongue that you yeah. can't learn it. Yes. I think that's a great way of putting it. So it's capable of being learned, but it's still different. Like, it's, there is still translation in it that we're doing. Um, but what, um, what's the name of the one of the bad translations you were just talking about? No Fear Shakespeare? No Fear, what, no, no Fear Shakespeare is not a transformation or a renewal of something living. Do you call it a transformation? No, it is not. I mean, it's doing what the message did to the Bible. 
Yeah. If, I don't know if you're familiar with the message, uh, but yeah. like the, the sort of the modern, uh, uh, it is an interpretation of the Bible as opposed to, well, I mean, it's not, yeah. For those who balk at the work of doing Shakespeare, it's something that gives them the kernel without all the dressing. Mm -hmm. So you get the information, you don't get to enjoy it. Well, it's going to help them pass a ninth grade public school test is what it's going to do. But not a Veritas one, am I right? (laughs) Nope. Good. Well, maybe, but not actually no. My my, that test is rough. (laughs) (laughs) Especially if they're only reading Spark Notes or whatever. It's a quote test. It's (laughs) it's a party. Um, So... Original work. Oh, do you have something? I was just going to say, like, here's an example of Act One, Scene One of Hamlet in No Fear Shakespeare. Bernardo, who's there? Francisco, (laughs) no, who are you? Stop and identify yourself. Long live the king. Is that Bernardo? Yes, it's me. You've come right on time. The clock is just striking 12. Go home to bed, Francisco. Thanks for letting me go. It's barely cold out, and I'm depressed. Um, (laughs) Versus... Like, tis now struck twelve, get to the bed, Francisco. For this relief, much thanks. Tis bitter cold, and I am sick at heart. Right? Like, it's, I don't know, it makes me sad. That, what about it makes you sad? That it's, it's a, it is a translation that is a dumbing down. Yeah. As opposed to a translation, well, it's a dumbing down because we, as English speakers, we should be able to understand Shakespeare as opposed to, we need a translation of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, or Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, because it's it's um, it's written in an old English that we can't understand. Yeah. You can kind of understand it. Um, you wouldn't be able to understand Beowulf, but you can kind of understand the old English of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. But you, but the translation um, is is necessary, whereas it's not really necessary for Shakespeare because it closely enough resembles the English that we use today. So it's yeah. kind of different, and words mean different things, and also Shakespeare just made up words because he could. But we can learn those things and then still get Shakespeare. Correct. There is, but there is still something we miss in not living at the same time as Shakespeare. I don't know. There's more to get out of Shakespeare than just translating words. That's what I'm getting at with the no fear of, like, you still miss something even if you get... Um, the plot mm-hmm. or like it's even just the basic the bare outbones of the plot because mm-hmm. um, you miss how the different characters talk um, by dumbing it down all to the same anyway so um, we will move on um, he speaks very highly so earlier he said that the poet is something or I'm sorry I gave it away but the translator is something of a poet mm-hmm. so the translator must be able it's not just going word for word they're making poetry and they're making poetry that needs to work in the language they're translating into. Um, that's kind of a... It, it makes the, the work of the translator sound much more noble um, than I would normally think of it. It's not just Google Translate uh, changing a bunch of words um, from one language into another. Uh, it is actually writing poetry and then putting the name of unnamed author of Beowulf or putting the name of Dante on it, um, which is kind of a higher... I mean, that's scarier to me, almost that I have to speak for Dante. I have to speak for name whoever it is. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay, so in that same vein, Benjamin goes on to say, uh, translation, unlike art, cannot claim permanence for its products. Its goal is undeniably a final, conclusive, decisive stage of all linguistic creation. In translation, the original rises into a higher and purer linguistic air, as it were. It cannot live there permanently, to be sure. Neither can it reach that level in every aspect of the work. Yet in a singularly impressive manner, it at least points the way to this region, uh, the predestined hitherto inaccessible realm of reconciliation and fulfillment of languages, not just the single language. So what the translator is attempting to do is not just change languages, but to get to the theme, the ideas in a work, and then bring modern readers to those new ideas. And that is a bigger work than just when I say the word translate and mean to move into a new language. So I think that's what separates a good translator from a bad translator, that they have the, when you gave your example of the Aeneid, (laughs) excuse me, you need someone who understands the Aeneid so they can make better translations of that work. Is that my off base? Sorry, repeat that. So there are differences between good and bad translators, and a good translator must know the work that they are translating exceedingly well, such that they make certain choices with the words that they're translating. Yeah. They 
you need to have a little bit of some swagger as a translator. You need to mm-hmm. you need to have a a, um, a belief in yourself that you understand the work to be able in its original language to be able to bring it into the modern context or into the into the into the, your your audience context. So, um, so it is adopting for context. So wait, what's the? I I, I kind of see where you're driving, or at least I'm trying to see where you're driving. Is your is your point that the translation is just as good as the original? Because if we read it on our own in the original, what we would be receiving is a type of translation anyway. So because we'd be doing it ourselves in our brains. Let me give you an example to get at it. Um, so in Don Quixote. Um, it's about a donkey, right? It is about a donkey named Hote. Uh, so this is the Penguin Classics version. Uh, and this is probably the first time I read about translation and cared about it or thought about it. Um, so um, I'm. So there's this part um, in the book. He's just giving an example of the difficult choices that have to be made as a part of translation. And I think this gets to, AJ, what you just asked. So he's talking about... Have you all read Don Quixote before? No, I've never read it. I read, I tried to audiobook some of it. It's very long. Um, so there's this one famous description of who Don Quixote is. Have you all um, heard before um, of the Knight of the Woeful Countenance? Is that something you've ever heard before? That's, it's in the um, uh, musical Man of La Mancha, which is based on Don Quixote. They talk about him being um, the Knight of the Woeful Countenance, which is this very, like, um, overblown... Over- romantic Romantic, yeah. yeah. And that's... It, but that's based on a certain interpretation of Don Quixote. Is Don Quixote this romantic um, man who, um, while he doesn't achieve his goals, he pursues his goals, and so in the end, he is in a way a hero? Or is he delusional? Um, is he someone who, what Cervantes talks about as he reads so many stories about knights, is that it? it um, he doesn't use the phrase "melt your brain," but essentially, it, it messes up his brain that he reads so many of these books that he thinks he's one of the knights, and then he goes on this. Long journey. So your your choice about who this Don Quixote is will change how you think of him. Um, so the original phrase that gets translated to Knight of the Woeful Countenance is El Caballero de la, de la Triste Figura, which literally means the Knight of the Sad Figure. Like if, if I'm just going word by word, mm-hmm. Knight of the Sad Figure is what that means. Um, and that has been translated as um, the knight of the ill-favored face, the knight of the rueful countenance, the knight of the sorrowful figure, the knight of the sad countenance, um, any one of those. But all those miss the point that Don Quixote has read a lot of books, but he's not educated, and Sancho Panza is not educated either, and Sancho Panza is the one who gives him this title. And so to think that Sancho Panza, an, un- an uneducated peasant, would use the word rueful, yeah, rueful countenance, like, of course he wouldn't say that. Or to say, uh, even sorrowful figure sounds overblown. Um, so in the Penguin Classic, it's translated instead as the knight of the sorry face. Mm-hmm. And like that gets that it. sounds more like what a little uneducated squire would say. Right. Yeah. And so that that's what I'm getting at. Of this is just one example, but just me having the Spanish to say el caballero de la triste figura doesn't tell me like. What does that phrase mean? I have to make a choice about what that means. And a good translator will make that choice in my stead, which you might look at as a bummer that I'm not making the choice. But like having read very little bits of Don Quixote in the original Spanish, you don't want it. <laughs> um, anyway, whatever. I, mean, I just wasn't very good at Spanish. Um, so the translator is doing a work for us that we would otherwise be doing for ourselves. And good translators will do good jobs at those things. And bad translators will make really interesting stories like Don Quixote really boring. It's like when you get an awesome tour guide. Yes. And they know the museum. They know these things. They have stories of it versus if you just go to the museum yourself and you don't really know what you're doing. You just kind of like float around. Or you know a little bit of, of all these things and you're in your interpreting or you're you're building the experience for yourself yeah. versus you are have been given a tailor-made experience yeah. by a master it, just continuing on that like do i trust my reading of beowulf more than i trust J.R.R. tolkien's reading of beowulf not a chance mm-hmm. do i trust my reading of um 
uh, the Inferno or Purgatory or Paradiso as much as I would trust Anthony Esselin's or Dorothy Sayers or whomever. Um, and the answer for those would be no. Like, I would, yeah, I do not trust mine over theirs. And so I think that's the only point I'm trying to get at with this is that a good translation um, makes these books accessible in a way that even if you study the language for years and years and years, it wouldn't be as enjoyable, wouldn't be as easy as we make it sound. Um, and I don't think it's any, I don't think it's necessarily a, a pure experience because you still are making the same choice as a translator is when you are learning the language and going to the original text of these great works. I think that's my point. Okay. Mm. Two issues with your point. Yep. Number one. Yep. Isn't there the danger if, no. especially if we take this, yeah, nothing's dangerous ever. <laughs> uh, isn't there the danger if we take this and extrapolate it, to, it's extrapolate it to even other things beyond language that we are taking the impetus from the individual and offloading it to the experts, saying, "You, why, why would you ever learn to change your oil? Are you ever going to do it as well as someone that, you know, has been changing oil for ten years could do it? Why, why would you ever do that? And if we do that too much, then." we make man only specialized and in worst case scenario not good at anything because he's d depending on every other expert ever right he becomes a cog in a machine and then only other people have the will to do the things that he should do himself so changing sure. oil is a bad, bad example because it's simple but say something more complicated fix your computer sure. right something like that isn't there the danger that we you know discourage students from learning a language because there are other people that have learned them better and have translated the works better than you could that's why I think it's important that schools do languages and do rudimentary basic translations so that our future translators get a taste for it who love it. So we have students who, so our school did for a long time only had Latin through Latin four. And then we had some students that got to Latin four early in their high school career and lobbied for Latin five. Mm -hmm. And last year we had Latin five that had two students and our Latin five teacher and these two students just sat around and from what they told me, like they enjoy Latin and they did translations of, it wasn't even, they did translations of, I think it was the Aeneid oh. or it was Ovid. Um, and so, you know, you get, yeah, there's something, there is a, a, a point, of, there is a, a type of education, there's a type of, of understanding literature that you get when you have to translate it yourself, mm -hmm. um, which is why one of my favorite assignments that we do, uh, that we did this year in our senior English class was that we made, our, our, as an extra credit, we had our students write an extra scene to Hamlet, mm -hmm. and it was the scene when Hamlet gets captured by pirates. Uh, Hamlet gets captured by pirates, and he goes back to to Denmark. And we had the students like discover the long lost scene, and they weren't. Trans it's only referred to. In yeah, it's only referred it's not, to. It's not actually a scene. So we're not having the students translate a scene, but we're having the students mimic Shakespeare in the Shakespearean English to try to create a scene that sounds like Shakespeare, which is a similar kind of headspace, mm -hmm. um, and that's a totally different. It, it what what it. What it does is it reveals How to well. us as teachers that the students understand Shakespeare more than just like, quote, decoding it to their natural, to like modern English. And I'm just going to read a little bit of one of the, uh, of one of the, um, the scenes that were, was submitted for the extra credit. So scene 5-5, five, five. enter Hamlet amidst fighting on board the pirate ship. The pirate queen, accompanied by her navigator, meet him at Blade Point. Pirate Queen, you dare aboard my ship midst battle time? Hamlet, alas, spare me a moment. I stand as no friend of that ship, perhaps one of yours. Pirate Queen, how now? You aim to trick me with sharp words. What business has your impudence on deck? Hamlet, death was nigh to meet me aboard that ship. My heart resolved, t'was better to perish at the blade of an unknown wielder than find my end at the hand of one called friend, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I mean, so that shows a knowledge, an inside understanding of Shakespeare um, that, I, I, that is sort of the same kind of headspace that a translator would have to Has do. To now, it's English to English, but, um, but that is what a translator is doing when they do 
medieval Latin or Italian to English. They sort of know the blood and guts and the life of the poem in right. order to bring it to English. Because it's what would Dante say today? Yes. I mean, I, is essentially the question. Um, you get into some fuzzy areas like where we talked at the beginning of, you know, if, if they took out the mead hall entire, or if they, if they took out the, the mead bench and said, he was angry. Do you really get the same he thing? He killed dudes. Yeah. And so I, but um, I think writing in poetry is different than just providing that summary. So the summary would not be good. Um, I think there's a place for experts. Um, and um, I do think that a, an expert will translate differently than a student will. Um, I just, I think it takes more, there's a, there's an image I have of I'm going to learn Latin or um, um, we're currently recording at Graham Donaldson's apartment and he has a copy of a book I love called The Intellectual Life uh, by A.G. Surleonge. Is it A.G.? Mm-hmm. Um, and A.G. has this thing where he says, you know, if, Order of Preachers. That's that? his, he's a, oh, is that what the what he, A.G. stands for? O.P. No, that's what O.P. Oh, stands for. Oh, oh sorry. Um, and he has this part where he says that if you learn um, Latin for six months, you'll be able to read Thomas Aquinas in the original Latin. It's a thing he says. I don't know if it's true. Um, Aquinas uses a particular type of Latin, church Latin, whatever. It's supposed to be easier to learn than other Latin. So could I learn church Latin and then read Thomas Aquinas in the original language? Maybe. You know, jury's out on that one. Will I get as much out of it as reading um, a Catholic who is, like, immersed in the theology of Thomas Aquinas, who is then doing the work of translation to bring that into English? Will I get as much out of it from the first as the second? Maybe, but it depends on how much time I put into it. And so I think that's the question that you get that is raised here. Of this, um, Benjamin also or Benjamin also says this um, that the work of translation is midway between poetry and theory. Uh, its work is less sharply defined than either of these, but it leaves no less a mark on history. So, what the translator is doing is not just um, the translation. It's not just the language learning I would get from taking Latin one through four. Um, it's also knowing. Um, structure of poetry in the original language and the modern language, and then the theories, the ideas that are encapsulated in that work. Um, and I just think that's harder than, that work is harder than me learning six months of church Latin. That's, I think that's what I'm trying to get at. Okay. What's yeah, the second one? I'm a, oh yeah, what's your second, what's your second objection there, Bert? My second objection was, and it may be answered already, but if, if I'm thinking that because someone else could do it better than me, if we, if we take that to all of language in general, then say my boss said something about, I don't know, a th- Thanksgiving dinner to Magby. Mm-hmm. And then Magby told me. And it sounded sketchy. It was like, I plan on killing and eating all of the turkeys myself, and I have five of them. And I was like, that sounds really weird about my boss. Um, it seems like the principle is, well, if I heard him myself, I would still have to do some interpretation. And since Magby is just as expert in the language as me, why not just let his word stand for what Troy said in the individual? It almost seems to validate rumor in that they, they are just as expert as me. They heard with their own ears, and I would also have to do some sort of interpretation. So why not just depend on theirs? This is a great point. So... Um, uh, what's the translation of the Iliad you use? A, it is Robert Fagels. Fagels. And like, it's a great translation. Um, so my first attempt at reading the Iliad was from um, the great books of the Western world. The Mortimer Adler collection has mm-hmm. Iliad and Odyssey in it. And it's, um, I don't know who translates it, but it's not good. Uh, it's just really boring and hard to read. While the Fagels one, um, like, the work comes alive. It's really engaging. Yeah. Um, so but they're both in English. Like they're both English translations of the original Greek Iliad. Uh, translation doesn't stop with just one translator. There are always new translations coming out. And I want to say the Fagels one came out in the 2000s. Yeah, at yeah, least it's recent. It's, it's recent. And Esalen also is a, is a recent translation of it. Um, the, 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 the copy, the translation that's going to connect with us is not necessarily going to be the one written in the 1800s. Um, you but, but what possesses somebody to say, you know what we need right now is a copy, as a modern translation of the Iliad in 2018. Like, how do you get to that point where you say this is what we need to do? But, but have, you, have you still answered my objection? Oh, sorry, guys. I think so in saying that um, just because a translation has happened in English doesn't mean it's the final translation. And yeah. so 
pretended said that Troy um, shared with Graham and a, and me and pick other people. Um, you would talk with multiple people to understand what actually Troy said, unless you were to talk with Troy himself. But that that's my point, is that talking with Troy myself would still be the best option. Sure. It, it might just be a bad example, because... Um, yeah, so maybe it's not a perfect analogy. Yeah, yeah. And um, so... Because in, in... This isn't spoke... Because this is written word, um, as opposed to spoken. Um, and it's also, you in know, thousands language. of pages. Yeah, right. yeah, as opposed to um, yeah. a five-minute... Okay. I'm going to kill turkeys. That's fair. Um, but yeah, but, uh, well, the part I'm getting at is that just because a work has been translated into English doesn't mean it's the perfect translation. And that's why, uh, so I think the Odyssey just had a, a, a translation come out. And if I'm not mistaken, it's the first female translator of the Odyssey. Yeah. Um, and so I don't know what that brings to the translation, but uh, I think that gets at your question, Graham, of like, why do we need new translations? Um, has it been made... Um, accessible, enjoyable, knowable to everyone yet? Um, or have previous works of translation only been for certain people? Hmm. Um, there's always room for a new translation. Yeah. So, um, unless you all have other questions, that kind of gets at the main point. Um, the, I, I guess your takeaway would be um, read good translations. And the only reason um, I clarify, like, it sounds like a dumb thing to say, but like, there's just... The Don Quixote example, especially, I lost my page, but like if you were reading a book that talked about the Knight of the Rueful Countenance, you'd be like, oh, this is the right one. Like, it, um, it sounds like it's official. It sounds like it's the difficult one to read. And it just makes me think of AJ's um, guide to not writing bad or whatever it was called. Like, things that... Um, How to write gooder is what I believe, what I believe is what it was called in the podcast feed. Um, but like, things that sound... Um, things that are complicated sound like they're better, but they're not. Um, and that's what I love about this um, Penguin Classics translation of Don Quixote. Like, it gets that um, they're two poor people who are traveling around, and they talk a certain way, and it's not um, the whatever English was called in the 18th century, whatever, it's not, that's not Middle English, or whatever you would call that, like, um, Elizabethan or whatever. So if somebody was translating Huckleberry Finn into French, there it is. Yeah. and they gave, like, High sounding words to Huckleberry Finn when he's when he's saying his sort of good old Southern English. It would be a bad translation. It yeah. would not. But what you would have to do is make Huckleberry Finn sound like a French. Tom peasant. has thou <laughs> consumed my jam. My stores stand in depleted stead. But, yes. but that but that joke is what um, Donkey. What previous translations of Don Quixote have done? They've made him sound like he's this. I keep wanting to use the word highfalutin, which makes me sound not highfalutin. Florid? Yeah, sure. It, it, it makes him sound florid. In, in, um, <laughs> we are in Texas, so sorry. Apologies, <laughs> but not sorry. Um, uh, it, he is more florid than um, the character himself should be. Is that? But I'm, just because it's complicated doesn't mean that it's wrong either. I mean, take, sure. take Shakespeare, for example, right? Perhaps that's why we get all this high-flown language is because Shakespeare does seem complicated. Mm -hmm. But the caveat that Shakespeare's good. It but he also, this is what boggles my mind, like he was writing for common people. Like when you went to the Globe, they had this like whole section of people that got in for cheap. Like they're the ones who are there to enjoy but it. But when it is acted, it is easily yes. understood. Yes. Easily understood. Yeah. Right? When you read it, sometimes it's a little tough. But in the translation of actually being put on the stage, those passages are readily understood. Yeah. That's such a good point. We should do another podcast on that. Uh, yeah. We're at 52. So if you want to. Great. Yeah. Uh, so this has been Classical Stuff You Should Know. I'm AJ Hanberg, that's Thomas Magby, and one Grab Donaldson over there. Grab. Grab Grab Grab, grab him Donaldson. And it's summer, and so that's happening. And you if you wanna tweet at us, you can tweet at classical stuff at Twitter, C L S S C A L stuff at the twit. And you can check us out online at classicalstuff.net. You can email us at classical stuff at veritasacademy.net. And apparently, we are still getting the Catherine Ball thing wrong. Yeah. He was not the confectioner no. to William the Conqueror. Sorry about that. He was he designed chariots for yeah. William the Conqueror's brother. Yeah. Yeah. So William was doing a lot of conquering. Yeah. The brother was helped in William the Conqueror's army, yeah. and he required his own chariots. She's related to the guy that built and designed those chariots. So William and, the Conqueror's charioteer. charioteer. Yeah, and so because well, was it the charioteer or the designer, the designer of the, oh, the, the chariot, chariot. Yeah, yeah. Um, not yeah. just the charioteer. Charioteers yeah. aren't paid well. Mm. Chariot designers mm -hmm. are paid well, mm -hmm. and so because. So 
William still... and his brother Daniel yeah. were yeah. very successful. Yeah. Uh, this guy made a lot of money. Eventually, had a castle. So it's not a castle. Oh, so suites. still, it's still it's the a, castle. St- so still owns the castle. Yeah, that okay. part we didn't screw up. Sure. Like yeah. they, she does have a familial castle. Yeah. It's that the money was not earned with confections or sweets or sure, designing. You know, yeah, sweets and stuff. It, it was, was a bad it was translation. Actually of confections. Yes, yes, yes. Exactly. So that was our own fault. So sorry, <laughs> Catherine. Uh, we'll get it right. And if you would like to translate the transcript of this podcast yeah, into Shakespearean English, you can email us at classicalstuffatveritasacademy.net with your excerpts, and we will read it on the next podcast. Yeah, That'll that be sounds fun. great. Yeah. Okay, thanks for listening. Hope you had a good time, and, uh, you know, stay cool out there. It's a hot one in Texas. If you're listening to this in Scandinavia, you know, go <laughs> we, take a swim. We're jelly. <laughs> I bet we it's are. cool up there. Yeah. But down here, it's, it's blazing. So, you know, stay cool, folks. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>